today we're going to just uh, finalize things and show you all the missing links on the doctrine of tithing that the uh, pastors all skip over. And it's uh, something that's very important. We have it marked in our Bibles. As we'll be con conf confronted by this at one point in time in the future. First of all, tithing is not for true Bible believers and Christians. Everything belongs to the Lord. If you're saved, everything belongs to the Lord. Even, even do I. I belong to the Lord too. You know, I was bought by his blood. If you're saved, you're bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. A forced or guilt-induced tithe is a doctrine of devils. Especially when that pastor says you have to give 10% plus more uh, of your salary that he's enforcing on his congregants. So it was always a law only for the children of Israel under the law. It was always that. We kind of talked about that before and we talked about Leviticus. But I'm going to show you another verse in Leviticus that's very interesting. Is uh, Leviticus 27:34? Next to this, Leviticus 27:34. That pretty much enforces everything I've said. That's the last verse in Leviticus, because all those commandments in Leviticus about tithing and everything is summarized in the last verse. And it says here, God says here, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. So tithing was established in Mount Sinai for the children of Israel. So tithing was for the Jews. It's, it's, it's not the New Testament doctrine for the church. It doesn't, doesn't belong in the church. Over in Acts 2, 3,000 people were drawn to Christ. Leviticus, that was Leviticus 27.34? Oh. In, in the book of Acts, and actually in Acts 2, if you ever read Acts 2, uh, the whole thing is very interesting, 3,000 were drawn to Christ, and they had all things in common. So where was the tithing? This is the New Testament. They had all things in common in Acts 2. And... Uh, they sold some of their houses and some of their lands and laid all the money at the apostles' feet. And you'll hear all the modern pastors preaching this. Come, bring your money, put it at your apostles' feet. But they don't go on and say what that actually says. Because if you go to Acts 4, the book of Acts 4, you can actually read that. It's only two verses. Acts 4, 34 and 35. Read exactly what it says. And don't let a pastor deceive you on that verse. Acts 4. And you're going to get almost every pastor throwing this in your face. Some of them are smart enough to stay away from it and deceive you somewhere else. Not that all pastors are deceivers. So Acts 4, 34 and 35. Neither was there any among them that lacked. Do you understand those words? Neither was there any among them. These, these were wealthy people. They owned lands. They owned houses. Lands and houses. Okay? Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands. Not land. Lands. Or houses. Sold them. And brought the prices. Brought the prices of the things that were sold. I need new glasses. Verse 35. And laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according to as he had need. So what did the apostles do with the money? Eh? Did they buy themselves a car or buy themselves a big house or buy themselves a bunch of land? Andre Misikaba, Dr. Anders, hoor. 34 years old. Young boy. Het is niet zo dat je een salaris daar hebt. Nee, ik heb geen salaris. Ik doe pro deo. Er is zoveel geen auto voor u te kopen. Want andere, and, want look nou, net als feit dat ik denk, 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 denk. Bonumang, zet ik euro naar zo. Yeah. Heb je ook van die dat soort kerken, PSG, duidelijk dat a, a voorganger of een pastor waar je vooruit? Ja. Yeah. Is dat wie? Ja. Yeah. Oké, okay, laat me dit ervan zeggen. Is dat mijn loop voorbeeld? Is mm. wanneer een gynaecoloog een grote auto koopt, zegt niemand iets. Mm. Maar die gynaecoloog heeft het ook van de inkomsten die hij heeft vanwege 
de diensten die hij verleent aan de gemeenschap. Mm -hmm. ja? Waarom zou een paaster niet in een mooie auto moeten rijden? Ja, ja maar dat, ja. dat is 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 dat Or, or walking to, to, to the fellowship, wherever they met. Every man according to he, as he had need. So it wasn't kept by the pastors, as the pastors are doing today. These apostles, they distributed it all. So that sounds a bit more like tithing to me, doesn't it? Your pastor says tithing. That's it. This is a lot more than tithing. Does it not? Now, did the apostles use it for themselves? No, of course not. The apostles divided it out intelligently, very intelligently. They were very careful how they gave that money out. The converts they were very wealthy. None of them had any lack, right? They sold extra houses and lands they didn't need. And anything they didn't need, they gave to the work of the Lord. They gave that to the work of the Lord. Not a percentage of their income. This is just nonsense what they're teaching. So we know this. How do we know this? Because later down, you're going to find, if you read that whole, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole book of Acts 5, 6, you're going to find out that... Uh, They later met at Martha's house. So if Martha gave her house and sold it for the money and put it at the apostles' feet, how did they later meet at Martha's house? Martha had more than one house. You see? So later on they went and met at Martha's house. So I've worked in third world countries where pastors don't even have a car, they don't have a house. Some of them live with their parents still. And they're preaching, waiting patiently and faithfully on God to supply their needs. They don't go to the congregants and say, give me 10% of your salary. You know? If God doesn't provide for you, it's not him guiding. It's not him guiding. You don't go and ask for these things yourself. So many pastors are looking also for ties to expand their building programs or build another church here and train young men, build another church here. Another. So they're looking for ties for this. So they moved into tithing. And this is very dangerous. Why? Because pastors are building these churches. What did Jesus say? I will build my church, Jesus says. Jesus is going to do it if you wait patiently on him. And if you want to see that, that's in Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18. It's good to know that because all the pastors say, oh, we need money, we have a building program to build a church. No, Jesus says, I will build my church. You wait on him to do it. And besides, we're the church. So what are they doing building all these buildings for? Matthew 16, 18. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus was talking about himself. This rock, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Catholic Church actually uses that to say Peter was the first pope. Well, that's an outright lie. Because Peter wasn't the rock. Jesus was. Peter was just a pebble. Petro, pe pe pebble. So why are pastors putting themselves in the mindset that they are the ones responsible to do the money collecting and the building by placing their congregants black under the law? Why are they doing that? The gates of hell are going to prevail against them. The gates of hell will definitely prevail against, against their buildings, which will very soon be owned by the Antichrist, the ones that don't have the Antichrist spirit already, and most of them do. You can hear it when you go in there. You've got all these different Bibles and reject the Word of God. Now, tithing also was never required for maintaining a temple because you're going to hear all these pastors tell you, well, you need to tithe because we need the money to service the building, pay the rent, pay the electricity. They're always going to say this. They don't trust God. They're trusting you, man. But uh, they say all this. But let's go to 1 Chronicles 26, 27 and see what money was used for the temples, which the pastors actually, they call the churches or temples today. First Chronicles 26, 27, and we'll see what we choose to maintain the temples. Because God told us what to use to maintain the temples. That's the Old Testament, 419. Page 419, in my Kings Chronicles. So this is 1 Chronicles 26, 27. Let 
27. Out of the spoils won in battles did they dedicate to maintain the house of the Lord. So all the spoils of battles, they dedicated those treasures and, and those valuables to maintain the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord. So that's how the house of the Lord is maintained. And all the pastors say, oh, you're in the house of the Lord. Well, it's maintained by the spoils of war. So send us out to fight a, fight a war, rob a village, and use those spoils to maintain your church. Don't ask us for part of our salary. It's a doctrine of devils. Doctrine of devils, yeah. And the lands, you know, and during the spoils of war, the lands were always given to the Israelites. And, and how was that done? God would send down big stones from heaven to destroy the enemy. And then just go take all the spoils. Hailstones crash through windows. They shred trees. Baseballs just fall from the sky. Other time, that was the Israelites. They wouldn't took all the spoils. But he wiped out these whole armies with these hailstones in heaven, and he even stopped the sun. One of Joshua's battle, he stopped the sun to win the spoils of war. To maintain the temples. And that's in the book of Joshua. You've got to see that. It's really interesting how he sent these big stones to destroy the enemy. Kill all the enemy with big stones from heaven. Joshua 10. Joshua 10, 11. Now this was during a slaughter at, at Gibeon. And uh, the enemy actually started running away. They're so afraid of the Israelites. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them. <laughs> Unto Azekah, and they died. God slaughtered the whole army of great stones out of heaven. They were more which died with hailstones, so these were actually stones of ice. Massive stones of ice that came and crushed the enemy. Then they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So God killed more of that, their army than the children of Israel themselves during the initial battle when, when they scared the enemy. So, and then the sun standing still, we can see that in Joshua 10 12. Then spoke Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amor Amorites before the children of Israel. So, this is another battle. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. And thou, moon, in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. So most pastors that, that ask ties, they don't believe this book is perfect without error. They don't believe this book. They don't believe it at all. They criticize me for, for saying it is. This is perfect. God's perfect word. They criticize me. Oh yeah, uh, you, think, uh, uh, you think that uh, uh, God's word is only in your English Bible. They criticize me. So they think that you need to go back to the Greek or Hebrew to hear God's true words because no Bible is perfect. You ever hear about Bible say, oh yeah, no Bible is perfect? They think, that, that, that you, but most of these pastors also take tithes and they also say that water baptism is for believers or that you have to speak in gibberish tongues or get slain in the spirit. They, they say all these stupid things. You know, they're liars and they're, they're of the father of the devil. And you want to see that? Go to the book of John. 
Go to the book of John 8. And you'll see that here. God's going to tell us what they are here. And show us what they are. Book of John 8. Remember, a lot of people, when you're talking about the King James Bible, it's too hard to understand. You ever hear someone say that? Oh, that, that's too hard to understand. That book's too hard to read. I need an easier version. Let's find out. Let's find out what's going on here. And the pastors say that too. Chapter 8, verse 30, uh, 43. This is God speaking. This is Jesus speaking here. Why do ye not understand my speech? Where's God's speech? In this book. It's in this book. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil. You know, this book is God's speech. They always say it's 200, too, you know these guys that say it's too hard to understand, this book? You know what they are? If They say, if someone, you're talking to someone, you tell them King James Bible is a pure, perfect word of God. Oh, it's too hard to understand. They're not saved. They're not saved. They don't believe God. They don't trust God. They don't believe his words. And this is what Jesus said about them. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. They don't have the truth. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. See, so when you tell someone the truth in this book, they don't believe you. Oh no, God's word can't be in just one book, it's impossible. No. Which, which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Do you hear these words? Do you hear these words when they're spoken? Do you understand it? Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. God, Jesus is telling us these people aren't saved. They don't believe his book. They're not saved. So, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. If you've got a false Bible, you're not saved. Oh, and back in Genesis 14, remember we talked about that yesterday? We can just look there really quickly. Genesis 14, it was the king of Sodom that made Abraham. And Everyone knows about Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Fourteen seventeen. 14. I think we read this verse yesterday. Let's just read it again so we got it in context here what we're talking about. And the king of Sodom. What did it say? And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedor Lamor. And the kings that were with him, so there was other kings with him, at the valley of Shiva, which is the king's dale. And of the kings that were with him. Uh, now notice this was the king of Sodom. He was a wicked king from a wicked place. God destroyed Sodom. He's a wicked king from a wicked place. But why did the pastors always put emphasis on Melchizedek, who was probably also there? They always put emphasis, but they, they, just, they just ignore the king of Sodom, which Abraham, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons, verse 21. Go down to verse 21 and, and, and read, read, read what happened there. Then you're going you're gonna to put it all in the context. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods to, their, to thyself. Why do you think the king of, king of Sodom didn't want the money, didn't want the spoils, didn't want the tithes? He just wanted the persons? Why do you think he did that? What he wanted to do to the angels in Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels were there to protect Lot and take Lot and his family out. He wanted to know them. So the king didn't want tithes, he wanted the persons. So the prophet Malachi, now let's go to Malachi because everyone's fighting with me on, on Malachi uh, that I speak to about this. They're fighting with me on Malachi. Oh, we should listen to Malachi. It's in the Old Testament, but it's for us too. Let's just double check. The prophet Malachi says to the priest to bring the tithes into the storehouse. That's Malachi 3.10. He says to bring the tithes into the storehouse. The storehouse is, is God's temple, right? That's what the, the past modern popular pastors are saying today. It means you're to bring the money into their church building because in their church building, in their eyes, is the storehouse. That's the storehouse. You're to bring the tithes to them. So that would be in, in Malachi 3.10, which you, you already know that. You don't have to turn there. 
You already know that. But you can check it out later. You probably already got a lender line in your Bible. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there be, be maybe meat in my house. Not money in my house, meat in my house. But where did Jesus tell us that, tell us that tithing is to go today? Do you know Jesus told us where to put the tithes today? Where did he tell us where to put the tithes today? And this is, this is above and beyond what we're supposed to do to help the widows and the fatherless. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3.16. Where does God tell us where to put the tithes? 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Know ye not, ye are the temple of God. What did that just say? Ye are the temple of God? So that means that you and I as believers are the temple of God. So we're supposed to put the tithes and the offerings and the meats in the storehouse, the temple of God. Where do we do with it? Ye are the temple of God. And the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Yeah, we're saved. The Spirit's in us. We're the temple. We're His temple. We're His holy temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. So we're not to defile our bodies. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You see? Jesus, God just confirmed it to us. We're His temple. So are we, when we take the tithes and the offerings to the church building, we're supposed to be taken to the temple. That's us. So that, are, the, are the pastors sharing the tithes with us? No. They're keeping them for themselves. So the tithes aren't being divvied up above us. We're the building. We're the temple. So why are these billions of dollars going into church buildings today? In, in America, it's something like $86 billion a year goes into church buildings. Billion dollars. Just in America alone. Well, if there's so many suffering believers in the world, there's, there's say, people suffering in the world, in countries suffering and starving to death, and all these money, money is going into these big church buildings for their fancy lights and stuff. You know what? Baptists also preach that tithing, wine and strong drink, is not alcohol. Why did I say tithing? Why did I say that? Let's look. Let's look at that. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy. Go back to the book of that. What are you supposed to do with your tithes? Go back to the book of Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14. This just gets really interesting. Deuteronomy 14. Starting in verse 22. Let's see what God says about the tithe back here. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in a place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of corn... See, where, where do you eat this? The tithe of corn, of wine, and of thine oil, and of thy firstlings, and of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So we, they were to do this back then in remembrance to fear God. Verse 24. And if the way be too long for thee, wherever God tells you to go, he tells you to go somewhere to have this big feast with all your tithes, that you've collected all year, be too long for me, so that thou art not able to carry it. You might have, if ten percent, you might have a thousand. You might have ten thousand animals. So you got to take a thousand animals, or a thousand, yeah, a thousand animals with you. It's too hard to. You sell them. God says, sell them. Let's let's just see what exactly what he said here. If the way be too long for thee, so thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set His name there. When the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money. Wow, money is mentioned. Eh? Thou shalt turn it into money and bind up that money in thine hand. 
and shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. So that tithe money, we're to enjoy with our household. What what did we, well, wait, wait, wait. Let's look at what this says now. For thine household. And the Levite that is within thy gates, and thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. So the, the Levite couldn't own anything, so you had to take care of him back then. But the Levite priest, the priesthood is gone. So we don't take care of the Levites anymore. So when wine is mentioned with strong drink, it is alcohol. Absolutely. And that's alcohol that God has mentioned there. Now these Jews were actually instructed to drink alcohol and anything they lust, anything they lusted after with their tithes. So how did the pastors get it that we're supposed to bring the tithes to the church building? We're supposed to have a party with that money. How do they do that? Does your pastor to tell you to go buy anything your soul lusts after with your tithe money? I haven't found one yet. He takes it and puts it in his pocket. I haven't found one yet. So anyhow, these were Jews and they were instructed to do this and drink the alcohol with their tithe money. We don't tithe. We don't tithe. There's no tithing for us today. So Baptists and other preachers also state in 1 Corinthians, live of, and you'll see that if you go to 1 Corinthians 9, we have to, we have to look at that because all these pastors are doing this. They're in this error. 1 Corinthians 9, 13 to 15. 1 Corinthians 9. It's good to mark this scripture down too because it just, I'll just show you how to trick you with the scripture to deceive you. 1 Corinthians 9, 13. And we're going to read this carefully because this is very important. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of. Look very carefully. Live of. What's that word? O-F. Live of the things of the temple. In other words, you're living of the things of the temple. Us. We're living of the things. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Now look at the context. Minister about holy things Live of those same things. Does it say live off? All pastors add an extra F there. And you'll see it in the next verse. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of. Is that off or of? O-F. Live of the gospel. And they always think, oh, that's live off the gospel. So where do you get the tithes in the offering? Live off the congregants. No, that's not what God said. So here pastors stop and, st and state, therefore we preach. So we spend all our time, you know, what does it take? You can actually put a sermon together in 20 minutes. You can go through, and you can put a whole sermon together in 20 minutes, but just using one search word. And they say they spend all their time all week preparing sermons, so they should be entitled to 10% of your salary. Wow. Huh. So here the pastors state that they preach, so they should live off of it. They add an F, F to that word, off of it. No, it doesn't say live off. But what is it that the scripture actually says? They which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. You're living of that life of the gospel. And you're teaching the gospel to others. You're giving it 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. You're giving that gospel to other people according to the scriptures. You're living of it, not off it. But what did Paul, who never asked for money from the saints, say? What did Paul say? Paul's our apostle. We've got to listen to Paul. In verse 15, Paul said this. But I have used none of these things, neither have I, have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than any man should make my glorying void. So God glories in the gospel. I mean, Paul gloried in the gospel. He never took money from the saints. Well, the saints brought him money once, but he never, ever asked for money from the saints. Never. So look, if you have rich people in your congregation and you're asking a 10% tithe, 
You have, you have a guy, he makes a million dollars a month. And you ask, you're going to get $100,000 a month from that guy. So you start teaching tithes, who are you going to favor? Who are you going to direct your sermon to? Everyone that's, that's, that's in the congregation or that one guy that you're pulling 100 grand a month out of? You're going you're gonna to gear your whole sermon for him. And God said not to do that. God's not a respecter of persons. We don't do that. And uh, you focus your sermons on him, you become a scribe. Then you're going to start writing books to give him more information. You become a scribe. And we know what God said about the scribes in the scriptures. So Jesus is actually rebuking the corrupt church building system. And we'll see that further in Mark 12. If you go to Mark 12. You'll see, that you'll, 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 see, you'll see how Jesus is rebuking them. All pastors use Mark 12 to get your tithes as well. Mark 12. Well, most pastors. I shouldn't say all. There could be one or two that doesn't. Mark 12, 41. Or a few. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. Anyone hear the word tithing there? Anyone see the word tithing there? No, they were supporting a treasury in one of the temples. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in, hath, hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all did cast of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even of her living. So that widow gave everything she had. And if the church keeps that money and that widow can't support herself anymore, He's robbed the widow. And God warned us about, about robbing the widows. So can you imagine a struggling, a struggling family hearing a pastor teaching the, these things, making you feel guilty? And they hear the story from this hireling pastor. Pastors are hirelings that take money, you know. God, Jesus calls them hirelings all through the scripture. Study the word hireling and you'll find out what a pastor that asks for tithes is. He's a hireling. Imagine a family giving everything they have, hoping for a blessing, and their kids starve to death. Can you imagine? And these pastors, they devour widows' houses. They, they all, and God told us they do. We need to get as far away from the Thai teaching pastors as we can. Because Jesus is about to show up and they will cower and run. You want to see that in the scripture? Go to John 10, 12. Go to John 10, 12. And you'll see it in the scripture. They're, all these guys that take ties, they're going to cower and they're going to run out of the buildings. They're going to run out. John 10, 12. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd. Who's the shepherd? Jesus Christ. Whose own the sheep are not. The sheep don't belong to pastors. They belong to Jesus Christ. Seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Now Jesus also rebuked the, the corrupt temple system. He rebuked it. So, so everyone's using this as, oh, look, they cast in money in the temple. Jesus rebuked the corrupt temple system in Mark 13. Mark 13. Let's go to Mark 13. And you'll see how Jesus rebuked it. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus told them the system, the temple system had nothing to do with him and nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with him. We're to reject it. And we'll be destroyed just like today's church buildings. God's going to destroy them all. In Acts 7, 48, let's just see what...
what God, God, God thinks of these temples. Acts 7.48. Acts 7.48. Verse 748. How be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Jesus isn't in there. He's not in the church buildings. What are we doing stepping into a church building to hear from Jesus and then stepping out and he's gone? He's not even in there. We've been deceived. Read the scriptures. The real Jesus is not in those buildings. Come out of her, my people, he said. So we must not look backward under the law, but we must look forward to the power of his resurrection. You know, this King James Bible was written from the hand of God himself. Ask your pastor if what he holds in his hand, get him to hold his Bible. Ask him, do, do you hold God's perfect word in your hand? If he says yes, which he likely won't, which he likely won't, then ask him why he wants to put you under the law of tithing. You see? He doesn't have a perfect word of God. That's why he puts you under the law of tithing. You know, even Baptists glorify their pastors. And some Baptist pastors glorify their, their church buildings they, even more than, than God himself. And they blindly put their congregations under the law of tithing. Why? First, that's in 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. We'll just pretend about Fine. it. Fine. This is the <laughs> boomerang. Mm -hmm. yes. We can't see you back here. What? Oh, we can't see you. It's too short. You can't see you. It's too short. short. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's too short. Of course it isn't. You look the same. <laughs> uh, haven't changed since a while ago. No. <laughs> Thank you, girls. Yes, sir. Yeah. Where's everybody been this morning? This is the only group that's come. Well, they love you. you. They love you like we do. They love you more than they have. They don't love you as much as all as we do. We're the only ones that love you. got boyfriends now. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, because you know. You're the best one taken, and so they had to go get the second fast. They don't like us anymore. They don't make them like this. Unfortunately. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. I love you. You could have chosen a college of many, many things we do not have. We have no government support. We have no denominational support. All we do is barely pay the bills. Because they think they're real intelligent, eh? First Corinthians three. These guys think they're real smart, especially the businessmen type pastors. Three twenty to twenty-two. Uh, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise. That they are vain. So these wise men taking your money, God says your thoughts are vain. I gotta tell you, the money part of it was pretty nice. As a kid, I mean, think about it. Tithes and offerings from 50,000 people. Hello. <laughs> it created a lavish lifestyle for our family. My father owned most of the city where the church was. He owned a college, two high schools, two grade schools, a cemetery, lots of buildings. He was very wealthy. And even into our adult years, he owned us. Therefore let no man glory in men. They all glory in each other. They always say, oh, brother so-and-so did this, brother so-and-so. They're talking about their other pastor friends or their other apostle friends. 
I'm 73 years old right now. You'd be amazed what's going on. I'm right in the middle of a $4 million building program. I've got, I, I just bought a, a, a charismatic church. I just bought a hotel. I just bought a vacant lot. Our church is about to enter into a $4 million building program. I'm about to start two more schools. I don't know what they are. I just want to start a couple of schools, that's all. I don't know what they are, but bless God, at 73, I've never been as happy. I've never enjoyed preaching as much as I enjoy it now. They glorify in men, for all things are yours. All things are ours. All things are ours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cepheus or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. God gave them all to us and we're saved. He gave them all to us. Many Christians call their pastors and modern apostles father. Al Anderson College is not only an army, it's a family. I'm not the chancellor, I'm the father. I'm the father. I'm the father. I'm the father. Did you know that? They call him father. They're taught to call them father. And when they feel obligated, then you feel obligated to support him with your tithe money and your offerings. Because he's like your father, your spiritual father. You feel obligated. Especially the Jack Hiles crowd, Jim Jones, you know what happened to him. He in Lynn, Jim Jones looked for community and couldn't find community in Lynn as a town, which had a population of, what, a thousand people. But he did find community in the Pentecostal church. He saw that they were a surrogate home. He saw that the preachers were like father figures. You're going to help yourself and you'll get no help. There's only one hope of glory. That's within you. Nobody's going to come out of the sky. There's no heaven up there. You have to make heaven down here. And he said, what you need to believe in is what you can see. He said, if you see me as your friend, I'll be your friend. As you see me as your father, I'll be your father for those of you that don't have a father. He said, if you see me as your savior, I'll be your savior. He said, even so, if you see me as your God, I'll be your God. Well, I'll see you later. I'll see you later. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Father. Killed everyone in his congregation. They all call him Father too. And Matthew 23 9 is the scripture for that. Matthew 23 9. Matthew 23 9. What Jesus told us. 23 9. Which just throws the Catholic priesthood right out. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Now let's zip over to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, and what, what we're to trust in, not this tithing pastors and these tithing churches putting you under the law. What a Proverbs 3, what a Psalms Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not, lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. He's going to direct your paths, acknowledge him. Just acknowledge him. We don't, we're not to trust in men. And Ephesians, the last chapter for today is Ephesians 2.20. Ephesians 2.20. It's okay. He's talking about the saints and the household of God here. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the same cornerstone. What is the church built on? Right here. The foundation, the apostles, and the prophets. This is what the church is built on. If you got this, you are the church. Once this book is open, two or three meeting with them, you're the church. You're the church. So the King James Bible for the English. Now, now you remember, probably remember the story I, I preached on this before was... Uh, uh, the rich man and 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 and, and the uh, beggar ended up. One ended up in uh, the beggar ended up in, in Lazarus ended up in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man uh, ended up in hell. And he called out to Father Abraham to warn his brothers, right? And he called out to Father Abraham. He wanted to warn his brothers of the hellfire, the impending hellfire. What did Abraham say to him? That's in Luke. Let's just check that, so you don't forget. Luke sixteen twenty nine. Luke sixteen twenty nine. 
Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. See? So, uh, the rich man wanted his brothers warned. Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets. They had most of this book at the time. Most of this book. They have Abraham and the prophets. Let them warn them. So, Father God, thank you for this teaching today that we've ended this series on tithing. And uh, uh, just... Uh, Everyone's got the scriptures down now so that no one will be deceived anymore. And, and just uh, bless, bless everyone here. And, and we hold this book above all thy name. A lot of people say King James Bible worship, King James Bible believers worship your book. But you say to hold your word above all your name. Above all your name. That's how high you think of it. And just thank you, Father God, through your son, Jesus Christ, that uh, you've given us the truth here today. And we all have the truth in, in our hands. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You want me to elevate her head? Let me see. Where is the police? Sure, you can use this. I don't know, please, the nurse. Whatever you need. Somebody can help direct traffic. The guy blocked it off. He blocked out with his car. fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire.